Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Rob, thanks for, thanks for taking some time to join me on the program today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. So people will be familiar with the brand Cobra Estates. They may even be familiar with Red Island, but they're probably, as investors, they're probably new to your business seeing that it's only recently listed on the ASX. And, you know, I'm familiar with the brand and I've always, always purchased the purple label, which I've since learned through the prospectus that that's, there's a good reason for that. And so my first question to you is, how do I know if I'm consuming good quality olive oil? Yeah, it, it's reasonably simple, but it's not often, often not greatly understood. If you smell it and it reminds you of something fresh, it's been fantastic if it reminds you of something stale will be very suspicious it shouldn't if it reminds you of checking the oil in the car well it's probably no good um, because all all oils go off with age as they oxidize and they become fatty and um, rancid and the other thing is when you put extra virgin olive oil in your mouth the most important thing is that it's alive so you've got pungency in the back of your throat bitterness down the side of your tongue. And after you swallow it, your mouth feels really clean, like you've almost like you've had a juice. If it feels oily and fatty and lipsticky as well, it's go, that oil is not extra virgin. And then the level of that pungency and bitterness is, is all caused by antioxidants. And the more antioxidants you have, the better it is for your health, the better it smells and the better its taste is. Um, and, and different varieties drive different sort of styles within that. So it's got to be alive um, and they all go dead with age. How long, if I open, say like I open a bottle today here in my kitchen, how long you know, do I have to consume that before it kind of goes, it's no longer bitter, it's no longer alive? Yeah, four to six weeks is, is our recommendation. And so you buy a pack size that you use within four to six weeks. It's a very resilient oil with a lot of natural antioxidants um, and we store it after we crush the olives, we crush all of the olives within four hours and we store the oil in stainless steel vats away from light, um, oxygen and at temperature control. And that really preserves the antioxidants because they're not having to work to sacrifice themselves to keep the oil fresh. So we then bottle it just in time for the consumer. And when it goes in that bottle, we, on every batch, we calculate the best before date. And that's based on everything around that freshness of the olives and the oil at the time of bottling and but once you open it so you look at the best before date on cobram if it's within that you'll be fine and then when you open it four to six weeks okay correct me if i'm wrong but you you had some involvement in putting best before dates on olive oil right not just on your yeah, we did, in fact, industry we're... wide thing yeah look in the day the importers used to just stick on two years on absolutely everything, even though it was two days or it wasn't even extra virgin when they did it. Um, so we are, we've undertaken years and years of studies to work out how long an oil will last extra virgin olive oil of all the different qualities um, on a supermarket shelf, half day, half night, because light breaks down the oil at 20 degree average temperatures. You might have 30 in the day in Darwin and you know cold at night and whatever. And then we have a margin on that. And that's pretty much done. It's now been double peer reviewed and published and it's the global standard on how to do it. And in fact, it's a number of tests that overlay, but we have this machine called a Ransomat machine, which actually you get a small sample of the oil, you pump oxygen into it at 110 degrees Celsius. You heat the oil up to 110 and pump oxygen in. And we've calibrated it for every hour it'll last in there before it goes rancid is a month of shelf life on the supermarket shelf under normal conditions. Mm. And that's how we do it. Obviously, there's a few other overlays to a fatty acid profile and the level of antioxidants. And, um, and we've back tested all of that. So yeah, it's a, 
it, we've done something like 27 peer reviewed research projects now across our business, just trying to produce better outcomes for the consumers at a lower cost, to be honest. Mm. Um, we'll come back to a bit more of the benefits and how the industry has changed and people's consumption of olive oil too. Can I just focus on you for a minute though? Where did you grow up? We just spoke off air. Were you a farm boy growing up or? Yeah, I, well, I was born um, at, on a farm at Bar Calden and had my first 23 okay. years there. So that's where the Australian Labor Party started, actually. Mm -hmm. The Tree of Knowledge is in Bar Calden. So it's very much central Western Queensland, about, I don't know, 1,200 kilometres from Brisbane towards Mount Isa. Yeah. And so you're on, you, did, did your family have farm? Did they have a cattle or something like that? Yeah, we had merino sheep and cattle. Um, and unfortunately, um, my mum died when she was 39 and left my father with three children, um, all under um, 10. And we, look, I suppose <laughs> I, I often get asked, where do you get the motivation from? And, and my dad was, he only went to year six and he was a really hard worker. You know, he just never went on holidays or did anything like that. And you know, I was just inspired to try and do well. And he was very entrepreneurial, but he wasn't um, very, I suppose, he wasn't, he wasn't into nice things and holidays and cars or image or anything like that, which I really respect and love. And I suppose it was just, I won't say wanting a better life, but wanting a slightly different one for at least to be able to afford to have a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so he was at um i guess you know quintessential you know work hard on the farm make it make it work for you but you also work really hard to, to achieve that because i see some of the things that have maybe played out with you and your story in your business is that you're, you're working not just hard but you're working incredibly smart and we'll get to how you do that in a minute then how did you go from cattle and and sheep to olive oil where did that passion come from like was he yeah. pushing you to stay in farming or like no dad was an amazing person he never he pushed you to just work and but he was and and he said look when you leave school you can work for he for here for a year i'll teach you what i know and then you can go and work for someone else and i went and worked in the kimberley and the northern territory on cattle stations mm -hmm. for a couple of years and i really thought look this is fun and but you just eight in our days often and um, not very great pay. And I sort of thought, so, so to be honest, I, I enrolled and I spoke to dad about going to Marcus Island College, which is at Geelong. It's an ag college. And I did a one year agribusiness course there. I was 23 years old and I didn't even really know how to turn a computer on, to be honest. And it just was life changing for me. Um, and dad was hugely supportive. And we, I then sort of said, look, the wine industry, you know, Marcus had all these new skills. I said, the wine industry looks fantastic in Australia. You know, why don't, what would you, how would you feel if we bought a vineyard or something? And he was, he's just amazing. It's like, oh, you know, whatever you want to do. And so he eventually mortgaged our farm to buy a vineyard for $240,000 at Renmark in South Australia. It was a little vineyard in 1993. And yeah, it was, in, it was incredible. Um, that rise because the industry went really well. We worked so hard. My brother and I, um, he came and lived with us for a few years as well. And we just put all the posts in ourselves and planted and we borrowed money and we took lots of risk. And my dad never even came to the vineyard for like two years after we bought it, you know, because he was just a hermit on a grazing property at home. And it wasn't he didn't care and it wasn't that he didn't ring for a yarn, but he wouldn't, it was just, he was supportive yeah, he's an amazing man, and I, I'd like to think I could be half the person he is when it comes to, you know, giving your children a chance and giving young people a chance. That's wonderful. Well, it seems you, you're doing that through through your business today. So, when did you when did you meet Paul, and how did yeah, that so, that partnership come together? Yeah, so I met Paul at Marcus Oldham. I was doing agribusiness, and he was doing farm management. We so we we're in separate courses, and his was a three year course. Mine was only one. And after he left college, um, he came and stayed with us at Renmark. In fact, he worked on our vineyard for 18 months and lived with my wife and I. Um, he's a little bit, he's a couple of years younger than me. And 
everyone was talking about planning olives really that was a thing you know there was a lot of mis schemes most of them aren't even with us anymore because they all failed um i think nearly everyone has failed um and we sort of set about what variety should we plant where should we plant them just sort of things that maybe through the money from the vineyard his family we could plant a bit of a growth but we worked out we needed to plant 500 hectares to have any chance of having a low enough cost of production to compete and have a reasonable chance of high quality and we we just realized we had nowhere near the money it was going to cost something like 15 million dollars to do that so we set about getting family and friends to invest alongside of us and we got paid basically no cash we got a 10 percent carry free interest in the business and because the vineyard had done well i was about i was able to invest um sort of more into it as, as in just cash alongside the other investors. And that's been the base of our, our shareholding. And one of the reasons we went into it was because Australia could grow things well. Extra virgin olive oil was consumption was increasing and there was a lot of talk about health. Um, and both my, my dad died just after we planted the first growth um, of cancer as well. But you know, I've just been really interested in what foods cause chronic disease and what foods prevent chronic disease and, and everything in between and and olive oil was certainly we didn't know a lot about it but certainly the science and the and the reason to have olive oil was for the health that was that's always been out there but we didn't really know it was the antioxidants we didn't know that it was extra virgin not the refined oils extra light and pure and the other tricky ones so it was a it was a long tough journey and we nearly went under a few times but it was it, it's it's fun looking back and you sort of think about the good and forget the bad <laughs> as much we're, as you can we're we're an investing podcast so i'm actually keen to understand more about that when you said it almost went under a few times what actually happened in some of those instances um uh, uh, there was look there, there was all the minor there was all the normal things happen with a startup business that you know the some of the varieties didn't work very well in australia where they fantastic in israel um to do with climatic conditions um, particularly humidity in that case. There was solving harvester issues um, that we thought would be probably easier than it was. Um, there was. There was everything from when we, and these are sort of minor, but just, and that's why we've done so many research projects is just trying to solve problems to work it out on. You know, the, traditionally olives haven't been that intensive. They've been more just plant them up on that hill and just harvest whatever turns up. And we were trying to do it in a more of an intensive way to get, less inputs and more profit per litre, if that makes sense. But what really just about killed us very, very close was when Timber Corp, who were an MIS company, came to us in 2004 and said, look, we're having a lot of trouble managing our grove. And we, we produced 25% of Australia's oil with only 2.5% of Australia's trees. And Timber Corp had the opposite, around 25% of Australia's trees and 2% of the oil. I um, mean, they planted similar time to us. So we took over their management and then they said, gee, you've done a great job because we really did turn it around. You know, just, just the productivity went through the roof, like tenfold over on similar age trees. Um, and they said, will you plant more at Boundary Bend and, you know, will you scale up this nursery? And, and we were like, yeah, and we were marketing your for them on an open book. And, and we were just contractors to them. We weren't involved in the investor mis side you know we met our mm. forecasts as far as that goes but things got the better of timber corp with regards to the whole gfc and mm, mis in general and they went under and that put us under massive stress i mean our 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 bank went pretty feral because anyone involved with any mis was immediately not trusted anymore um you know they reduced our facility just instantly so our headroom disappeared uh, which they can do under the facility agreements where it says material adverse change, you know, all these things that you just don't even read and you sign when you're doing it all of a sudden came back to bite. Um, and, you know, we spent 10 months dealing with administrators, four different banks, advisors to the banks, you know, they even had an advisor to the advisors because they couldn't all agree. It was, there was something like 9,000 MIS growers who own the fruit, the banks own the land, and the tree it was very very and we were trying to operate the groves we owned the equipment we had the staff we actually had the sales and when they went broke there was 30 million dollars worth of fruit on the trees and only 15 million dollars to get it off meaning there was 15 million dollars to go to the growers or to someone and legally we weren't able to 
So we had to go to court and there was a week in court trying to solve all this stuff. And to cut a long story short, we finally, um, we finally able to keep the Groves going by saying that we would pay for it. We kept our bank on side. We had an IA appointed, an independent accountant, for those that don't know, to try and keep the bank on side to give us a chance to buy. And we went around our loyal shareholders and we, we raised the money to buy and we, we off-sold the water to help fund it because we couldn't afford to do it all um, with a super fund. And eventually, after 10 months, the costs that we'd put into the Grove were allowed to be deducted from the sale price. Um, and, and, and so it, it worked out. But, and we thought our problems were sort of over, but the, really, GFC really got worse and worse international price of olive oil went through the floor because because Spain, you might remember, and Italy and those countries were just about on the point of bankruptcy. So the growers were just dumping their oil and the buyers were just not going to buy it because it was a really, un, it's amazing how quick you forget periods of time that are pretty mm. bad. And the Australian dollar went through the roof. So the imported oil was so much cheaper on the shelf because they were getting a lot from the Australian consumer because the dollar was so high. Um, oh, and that was really tough. We went, had to go to the bank again, you know, the head of credit in Sydney, actually, because the head of credit in Victoria for the, one of the major banks wouldn't support us. Um, and, yeah, he, he said, I'll give you another 18 months, get it right. Um, and we, that was a turning point, to be honest. Mm. So that was, when was that? Was it in the depths of the GFC? Yeah, it was sort of, that, the really hard period was April 2009 till about, um, well, I don't know, mid-2012, just in that sort of period. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think financial year 2012, we reported good profit, you know, a profit. We just had all these young trees that we had to fund and because they're all planted by Timber Corp and they're all different ages and cost running a grove, regardless of size, is similar. Um, so when they're not producing anything, it's a lot of cash out and we, that, that became you know, an issue when we were selling the, a lot of the bulk oil to Europe at a really bad price because our currency was so high because we couldn't sell it through the brands because we hadn't developed the brands enough and educated the market and all those things. Yeah. Yeah, so, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And certainly um, I just learned a lot about not only myself, but about, you know, our business and you know, just how different it is dealing with, people in business and how different it is dealing with administrators and just what you think might make sense often um, doesn't but when you understand why you can see the reason why how you might negotiate with you if I'm trying to buy something it's totally different to an administrator who just wants to say no unless mm. you know it might be really bad if he says no <laughs> you know so it's <laughs> it's a different mindset if that makes sense it's not just yeah. oh that's a good idea yeah it's a good idea but I'm not taking the risk so not doing it <laughs> so Interesting. When when did you move from just supplying and you know working on the like effectively the production side of the industry to then having the brand, the Cobham Estate or its brand, and really nurturing that? Like when did that take off for you? Yeah, so we always set ourselves up as a grower of fruit and a and I suppose a miller of that mm. fruit into great oil and that we'd be able to sell it to brands and to international buyers because it would be really high quality and we had a reasonable cost of production. That's what we thought. We thought the higher the quality, the lower the cost. In fact, um, the highest price we're getting by far was from Australian brands who were making their mark and there was many, many in the day. I think when we bought Cobram, it was something like the number 10 brand. But we were their major customer or supplier to them and they had a purple label Mm. wine bottle which was a 375 might have even been a 750 but it was a 375 and it had no pour on the top but it was brilliant quality it's called murray river blend or Mar sorry murray valley blend and in 2006 the dugan family who founded cobram and that had been in the supermarkets for a number of years and it had sales of 2.1 million and we purchased it for 2.1 million dollars eventually in 2006 they had their main business interests were in steel and manufacturing and other things and they mm. wanted us to have it and we purchased it and for a long time we continued to purchase their their fruit as well from they were a little grove at Cobham um yeah and it started from there and so we 
we evolved it. it. It grew quite quickly after we purchased it because we had more volume of oil, more focus on it, um, potentially higher quality because we just always put our best into Cobram. And we had the pop-up pourer. Um, we started some TV ads and our whole marketing budget right through till 2000 and probably 10 or 11 was bringing people to the groves to see and they might be journalists or um, you know in those days it would have been editors of women's magazines I suppose and chefs and um, people who could influence and we would drive them up or sometimes fly them up I remember taking DC DC three with 28 people, including the editor of Women's Weekly from Essendon to the Groves. We had a lovely lunch in the Groves, but they see the harvest, they see the all getting made, they do an olive oil tasting, and you just tell the story and then they want to help you succeed. They knew how hard it was and how much money we we're losing. And that's sort of been self-fulfilling. And thanks to consumers buying and then loving the product means that we've been able to survive and, and build this industry. It's interesting because you're kind of the uh using the influencers before they were you know what we popularize now is people on instagram or online or you know these types of businesses so kind of running a not an oily rag but maybe something close um the marketing department so and it's, and it's work right you said the number 10 there which isn't what i read previously number 10 brand before you bought it um okay so this is all all really interesting you mentioned at the start that that there are lots of benefits for drinking good olive oil so not just the, the stuff that you get imported but the good the good stuff and i was listening to a in anticipation for this i was listening to a, a podcast out of the us actually which is which is good for you um from a, a nutritionist over there who said you should only ever have olive oil that tastes bitter because that's a chances are that's a good sign it's a sign it's a decent olive oil so focus on bitterness and and you, you're halfway there um, whether or not that's that's true in your in, in your opinion is another thing altogether. But I think I read that since you started marketing the way you have, per capita consumption of olive oil in Australia has gone from one liter to two liters, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that's where you see a real opportunity in places like the USA because increasing consumption and um, even though they already drink as a country, they drink a lot more olive oil and consume a lot more olive oil than us. Um, how much olive oil should we be having in our diet? Yeah. The science is pretty clear. There's been massive studies done in, in this area in lots of countries, the Mediterranean and, and even more recently, the USA. But between um, three and four tablespoons a day, and so think 45 to 60 or 70 mils, um, and the European, so in Greece, Italy, Spain, the consumption per capita is around 15 litres per head. And you mentioned before Australia is about two and the USA is about one. Um, and it's not just about how much you have, it's the quality that you have because they, the science is clear that it's the antioxidants that drive the health benefits. And the reason I was smiling when you said that the bitterness means it's a good olive oil that, that's true. The pungency also, which is what gets you right down here in the back of the throat, is another particular antioxidant. So the antioxidants gives you that punch in the back of the throat. And if you go and buy a bottle of Cobram Robust, for example, instead of the purple, go the dark green, and you have a drink of it and you swallow it and you swirl it in your mouth, you'll feel that <clears throat> it'll make you cough in a very uncomfortable feeling right at the bottom of your throat. And then you'll also get the bitterness or the dryness on the tongue, a bit like the tannin in a wine or, or a black tea that's really strong when it makes. And that's, that's really what dry. They know that those antioxidants, which are unique to olives, are what um, help prevent the chronic disease. And, and you need them in your diet often. And, and those mixed with others that come from fruit and vegetables and other good things form the basis of the Mediterranean diet, which forms the basis of less chronic disease which is probably which is actually what's killing everyone in fact there's a lady called um mary flynn who is from brown university in the usa um, at rhode island and she is you know a, a leading expert her job is to teach students for the last 20 years on what foods cause chronic disease and what foods prevent chronic disease and she made a statement that according to the research no food comes close 
in the prevention of chronic disease to extra virgin olive oil and it's the it's the higher the quality the better um, and the mm -hmm. science is clear that a lot of people can not have to go on medication if they get that bit right as far as blood pressure and heart and other things and i'm not subscribing this but you go and have a look it's it's pretty clear so um the fresher the better the more antioxidants the better and the value is in that and I, and you may have seen that the purple label is something like ten dollars worth of free um nutrition in every bottle of 750 cobram classic which is the purple um, if you went to the chemist and bought exactly the same amount gram for gram in vitamin E, squalene and the phenol mix. And if you went to our robust oil, it's probably $15 worth of free value. But if you go to an oil, it's, uh, you know, all the other seed oils, vegetable or canola, or whatever, it's like 20 cents. There's nothing. It's refined. And, and the other big thing in the category was that extra virgin, which is the juice of fresh olives, is, was only 30% of sales when we started this journey. Two thirds of sales were extra light and pure, which in fact the rotten olives that in the old days they would have made lamp oil out of, <laughs> and that they and call lampante. But new refining technology, the same as which they use actually in the seed industry, allows them to turn that fit, make it fit for human consumption, and they sell it to places like Australia and the US and other places as extra light, pure, and all these misleading terms that try and convince people that it's the best. But it's low in fat, or it's it's the and, and they even line price it. So it's so misleading. But our education process has not only increased consumption from one, well, we've partly been driving it, one litre to two litres per head here in Australia, but extra virgins now pushing 70% of retail sales versus 30%. Because people are understanding why would I buy this? It's got less health benefits, it's not as good to cook in as extra virgins, not as safe. Um, I might as well take extra virgin. And then when they taste and smell Australian or they know the story, they really don't go back because they know it's important to the, the family's health. So mm. that's that's sort of been the, the story so, of trying to educate. So some, uh, would, I be, would it be fair to say that there are some buzzwords like pure and extra light are things that we should probably, you know, if that, that's a red light, we should absolutely checking yep. ourselves before we purchase something like that okay yeah absolutely yep. and the biggest problem is that you can't go into the supermarket and open every bottle and say oh yeah I like the smell of that one that one tastes good you've yeah. got to buy it to know if it's any good so in reality you've got to know and trust your brand because the other sad thing about this industry and it's given us our opportunity to be honest so we you've know, got to be careful what you wish for but it's it's clearly the most adulterated food on earth because it's really high value there's way less produced than the demands for, and you can mix it with canola, palm, rice bran, and all these other cheap refined yeah. oils um, and make a fortune. And in fact, the New Yorker quoted, a, a had an article many years ago, but saying that, you know, they believe there's more money made out of adulterating or faking olive oil than there is out of the cocaine trade in the USA, you know, because there's just <laughs> incredible amount of adulteration. Um, so that creates our opportunity, but we then got to make sure that we over deliver on quality and never compromise. And, and that's something that we're, you know, we'd rather go broke than, than cheap. Um, and we nearly, when we nearly did a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine it's quite alluring, but um, the, you mentioned Timacorp earlier on had 25% of the trees and 2% of the oil and you had 2% of the trees and 25% of the oil. I'm trying to like square that. And the, the, the question that I had for you was around how you have used research. So no, 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 the nutritional and that like evidence-based marketing. But then on the other side of your business, I know you've taken huge strides to make things, you know, to automate processes, to have certain machinery and the know-how that you put into to what you do to make it a success and get more from what you're already doing. Because I'm trying to think, you said before, you know, the big issue, this is a huge demand uh, in this industry. The only reason it probably is adulterated is because there's, you know, not enough good supply coming in for the massive amount of demand. But, you know, in traditional economics, we think that should meet an equilibrium. There should be supply coming on board and, you know, demand should find its natural resting place. Like why, ha why are you able to do that when everyone else in the industry is really just hasn't worked it out? Yeah, there's a few questions in that. Uh, yeah, one sorry. is, <laughs> no, 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 it's perfect. One is that now we have we produce nine times more extra we produce nine times more olive oil per 
hectare um, than the world average. And we use 37% less water, you know, I think 60% less nitrogen, more than 80% less phosphorus per litre of olive oil produced than the world average. Um, and we now have about 20% of Australia's trees and we consistently produce 70% of Australia's olive oil. And it's because the right varieties, right climate, right management, right research, it's all a little one percent. It's not one thing. Yeah. Um, only 25% of the world's olive oil production is extra virgin and about 75% of the world's sales are extra virgin. And that's why I said before, if you don't know and mm. trust the brand you buy from, you'll be fleeced. And part of the issue is that it's not the growers. There's the average size grove in Europe is about one hectare. There's, I think in Italy, there's something like 1.1 million hectares and there's 1.1 million growers. And it, they're not doing any ripping off, if you like. The middlemen, the traders, the nine play, big players or so, whether it's nine or seven, doesn't matter. Uh, they, they don't own any groves. They don't own any mills. They're just buying, blending, mixing and marketing. And over time, those brands disappear because they lose consumers' trust or there's a story comes out or there's a class action like has happened recently in the States. Um, but the problem is the growers make more money growing rotten olives than they do growing fresh olives because consumers pay the same amount for extra light and pure. And to produce extra light and pure comes from rotten olives and the refining technology is cheap the grower doesn't have to pick the fruit, deliver it within four hours and whatever. It just lets it fall on the ground, sweeps it up, literally sweeps it up. There's stumps and sticks and rocks and everything in it. The oil content in it is higher because it's, it's evaporated the moisture out. Um, it's less weight to carry. Um, the, when it's overripe, the, the maximum amount of oil is accumulated in there. And so they actually make more money growing rotten olives than fresh extra virgin because the big global industry has let down consumers where whether they buy extra virgin or whether they buy refined or light and pure or even probably canola, it all tastes the same because it's mostly blended and terrible. So I'm generalising, of course, there is some good players out there. Um, but we in Australia have probably managed to be the first country in the world and, and, and pretty much the only country in the world where you can go to the supermarket and buy a gold medal winning oil like Cobram at the price that it is. It just doesn't exist. To get that oil in Italy, you'd have to go to the mill and you'd have to pay two, three, four times as much to buy it in bulk. Um, so that's, that's probably what we're really proud of is being able to change. And that's why I've been able to grow and consumers love it because they see the value and, and they do know and trust the brand and they can tell straight away if it's off just by the smell um, and if it's alive in your mouth. So there's, this is like a, I guess, a industry incentive to produce rotten olive oil, for lack of a better phrase. Um, how about then in terms, because I, I also heard that- I'm talking of, Europe there too, because California is different. They, they're certainly yeah. high extra virgin. You know, it's a lot smaller industry. But if you just talk Europe where- 70% of the world, 70 plus percent of the world's olive oil is produced. The growers, generally speaking, make more money out of growing rotten olives than they do out of fresh olives. And it's because they get more oil and it's cheaper. Isn't there some uh, tariffs or something that make it very difficult for Cobram's high quality olive oil to go into Europe? Yeah, there is. There's import duties into all of the EU uh, of look it's it's not quite you know double but it's it's nearly there it's, it's basically one point something euros per kilo of olive oil so i think two dollars fifty a litre which is roughly you know nearly the cost of production um and then by the time you put a retail margin on top of that on top of this import duty it's just not cost competitive but we're hoping when the uk um get sorted a free trade agreement with Australia, maybe our our cobram can go to the go to the UK and do well. Yeah, yeah, it's in the market. So okay. Because my question with before was going to be about how do you you know you and your team keep up to date with like the latest in farming techniques, um, you know, all, all of the nutritional academic literature. But it seems like at least for a lot of that, you are at the forefront anyway. So you're already seeing it come out of the universities and supporting them to 
to find new ways to do things better. How about, um, here, we'll stick here in Australia and then maybe we can cross over to the US discussion in a minute. How does it, the industry from um, you know, a purchasing perspective, now I'm thinking Coles and Woolies and how, how are the dynamics there? Because you can you control so much of the industry. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've risen to incredible feats in, in, in terms of um, in the amount of supply that you have here in Australia. Uh, is there certain benefits that come with that scale? Or are there? Yeah, so. um, it's cer certainly um, consumers, when it comes to Australian produced, I mean, we've got 20% of the trees and 70% of the supply from our own groves. Um, and it's all to do with the productivity of our groves, obviously, and the research that's done. And we have, so I think there's something like 16 people in our research and technical team, which are combined mm -hmm. in the groves, in the laboratory, you know, and that constant innovation to try and say, how can we do it better to get either high quality, low cost and or both. Um, and we certainly have a fair bit of demand from um, particularly the USA for high quality extra virgin, but we want to put it into this domestic market because there's no currency risk. Our consumers here deserve to be able to buy it. You know, we really have a look after Australia first unwritten policy, if that makes yeah. sense, policy. Yeah. Um, look, we've got a great relationship with the retailers. You know, we've had our issues, every fund that deals with the retailers do, but they've probably enjoyed the education piece and the um, the not just the sustainability because extra virgin olive oil or olive oil in general, in fact, is the only mainstream edible oil that acts as a carbon sink. So the rest are carbon emitted. So that's a big benefit. And then we're one step up again. So our little business offsets the carbon footprint of a medium-sized city like Bendigo every single year um, because of the way the trees grow and evolve and grow that crop. Um, and that's, you know, a really thoroughly... Um, reviewed and documented and um, referenced um, position that's been checked by, you know, the leading academics. Um, and so the retailers know that if consumers are buying extra virgin and it's higher quality, not only is it a good outcomes from them from a profit and revenue point of view, but they know it's better for health and better for the outcome of the community as well. And, and it's, and it's more sustainable. So it sort of ticks quite a few boxes. And again, you know, would they like to be buying it cheaper? Well, they, they always would, you know, but it just is what it is because you're in a market and, um, mm. and, and, you know, they know that, you know, if they want to source high quality extra virgin from overseas and or whatever, they can, they can also do that, you know, but it'll cost a lot of money. It's just, there's just chalk and cheese between the price of average or not even extra virgin and something that's really good. Mm. You, um, you mentioned your your father at the start of the show. You said you know if he's you know he kind of set the example for you. How, how do you, how do you how would you describe the culture in the business in, in terms of what you and, and the executive team foster? How, how have you kind of nurtured that as well? Yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's. I love that question. Everyone talks about culture, but what is culture and how do you nurture it? And, and really, I think it boils down to uh, people not needing to get the accolades for what they do and being considerate and compassionate and nice. And, and if their thoughts are around what's in the best interest of the company, there's rarely any arguments because you only argue usually, because most times it's pretty obvious what to do if you're just thinking about what's best for the company. But the reason I see arguments often is if someone wants to win the argument or doesn't like that other person or that sort of behaviour. So I suppose it's the traits of rewarding good staff and not rewarding poor behaviour or, in fact, getting rid of poor behaviour. And, you know, we have a... A bit of an unwritten policy, but we like to think that if if someone's good enough in our business, because they genuinely are, now it's never happened and probably won't, but they could get, you know, 
the lion's share of what might be allocated to staff. You know, I think that it, it, what, what you've got to be careful of is that your good staff leave and your poor staff stay. So you need to set up an environment where the good staff stay, one, because it's fun. You're at work probably more than you're at home and it's got to be respectful, pleasant, fun, enjoyable, motivating. It's got to be all those things, of course. It can't be like a toxic culture or you just you go somewhere else. You can't have also such a great environment that everyone f- turns up at midday and bludges on the guy who does work. And so you've got to, you've got to sort of get rid of the traits that you don't think are, that are hindering your culture or your greater good by being fairly ruthless and saying, well, that guy's not getting a pay rise because he just uses everyone and whatever or he backbites or that guy's going to get the sack or or girl or whatever because of this and then the good ones just really look after them make them make them feel empower them um and we always i always have a saying in our business that there's no such thing as a bad idea but some people have got better ideas than others of course but you just need to get the ideas on the table and everyone gets around. And instead of saying, no, oh, that's no good, that's a terrible idea, it's like, yeah, that's really good, but what about this, this, and this? Um, and I think that that sort of builds... It, it's hard to describe, and some people have trouble leading it. But you mentioned earlier when we were chatting off air that try not to, when you're talking to your audience, try not to use acronyms and be the smart guy and, you know, that's exactly like our accountants will go and talk to the people in the groves and the people in the groves will just bend over backwards to do the everything right with the paperwork because they don't use all these terms. They never say you must do this and you must do that. They'd say it'd be really helpful if you did this and this is the reason why. And we sort of ask people pretty regularly through our business, if you're doing something you think is a waste of time, completing paperwork, whatever it is, just tell us. And if we can't explain to you rationally why we need it, well, it probably is a waste of time and let's stop doing it. Um, and and there's, it's trying to get a culture of uh, passion, but that just doesn't come. That, that evolves because you know that no one cheats and everyone tries the best and, and you've got to own your mistakes. I'm jumping around a lot. I'm sorry, but it, I think it's I heard, a great topic. I think I heard, I don't know if, I think it was a quote from you. I think it was. So it could be wrong. Um, we said... Few people come to the business extremely passionate about olive oil, but after 12 months, everyone is passionate about olive oil because the people that aren't have left. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that was. Yeah, I think I, I think I think that I think I remember that. Yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> I think I said I think I actually said that if they're here for 12 months and they're not passionate about it, they must be dead. Oh, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I, I was trying to recite that. the PC version. <laughs> I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten about that until you started saying it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess mean, it pe- people love to work for a, for a business, and we're really, really lucky. Like, how lucky are we that we produce really high quality extra virgin olive oil that's out there? Um, you know, it'd be pretty demoralising nowadays to work for a company that pollutes with huge amount of carbon or manufacture cigarettes or you know what i mean it's it's things yeah, it's have totally just evolved different. and and certainly um you know the trust in big big organizations i think is probably worse than ever and and that's a real warning sign to growing businesses like like us um i think when i was chatting to sam before um you guys since is it since 2009 you've been a public unlisted company is that right yeah 2005 2005 so you've been yeah. Because my question to him was around, um, you know, how do you guys, because the IPO, I find I found the IPO to be a, very unique here in Australia because normally, you know, insiders and sell, IPO for a reason, right? To sell their shares and to, to, to have a liquidity event. But in, in the case of you and the team, it doesn't seem like that at all. Um, but I know you've had shareholders for a very long time because employees are shareholders, like you said, um, and so the IPO was a little bit different from that respect, right? So did you, over the years, have you used equity in the business as a, as a key financial motivator for the team as well? Yeah, we have. Yep, yep, yep. And, and we've probably discussed every year since 2007 or eight, you know, 
should we list? Because we've always got people on the street coming to say, well, you should list this company and we can do this and we can do that. And, you know, we've had others coming wanting to take major stakes of other company who wanted to buy us all. You know, we've had lots of discussions over time and we spent a couple of days um, looking at this. Uh, we're, the, one of the reasons we listed was because if you think about a liquidity event, one way is to say, we'll just trade, sail it and everyone's been here 20 years and we all get our money up. But none of the key people wanted to sell their stake because there's so much runway in front of us. And personally, from my point of view, I can't think of anything better to invest in, you know, that isn't a beach house or something that's personal than this business. And you think, okay, well, you pay your tax on the money, then you invest it somewhere else, you probably make less. Um, and we got a lot of confidence. So we didn't want to sell, but how do you keep everyone happy when there's 700 shareholders and some of it, a lot of put their money in 1999 and who weren't saying we need to list, we need to get out. It's just more people die, they go broke, they have a divorce. There's always reasons that someone needs to sell. It mightn't be just because they don't like the business. They might've gone broke in their other business and need it. Um, and, and in fact, I've had some beautiful emails from even Timbercourt growers because we go first right to them to invest in 2010 when because we thought that was only right. And I've had people email me saying it's been life changing for them. You know, they don't have anything else, and they got they put twenty grand into to Cobra and then they're going a year ago. It's worth two hundred or something. It's been really nice. Um, but we have a, we sat down our key staff and the two CEOs in particular, and we couldn't really afford to give them pay rises, but we gave them options over shares, which were higher quite a bit higher than the current price but for 10 years they had to be there 10 years to get them and said if you really believe in it and and so it didn't cost them anything but that now has made them very wealthy people on paper <laughs> um and yeah so we've we've tried hard to and we've just you know given more options out to staff who we think are the next future leaders for the next 15 10 say so five to 15 years um long dated options to sort of um, reward them for a, often a lifetime worth of work. Um, mm. And if it, if it doesn't work, well, they're not just running off with, if it doesn't work, well, you know, everyone's happy. So how does it work? Yeah, it does. How, that's great. How, how does it work with you, Leandro and Sam being joint CEOs? Why did you choose, choose to go with a joint CEO approach? Yeah. And, and, and some people don't like that approach as you would, uh, because they're so complementary of each other. And to be honest, both of them were keen to do it as long as the other one was there. Neither of them wanted to just do it by themselves. And we're a reasonably complex business. It's not like we're just a marketing business or just a manufacturing business. It's, it's ag, research, finance, marketing, manufacturing, you know, and this of, of, observed them both work so closely together for so long that I know that their egos won't get in front of what's best for the company and they won't go, oh, it's not fair, I'm smarter than you. Or, and, and we've had these chats with them as well around, around that. And, and Sam's been with us 12 years and Leandro's been with us 20 years and they just deserve the opportunity. They're bright, they're honest, all the staff like them and they talk to each other all the time anyway and I'll hardly ever see them have an argument. Now, of course, I'll disagree on some stuff but they're so respectful that I think it can work and I think can work really well and share the workload particularly as a listed company of you know how much the markets and and investors want of management time mm. it's uh, yeah it, I would just say it's unique right it's not necessarily um, a bad thing in my opinion it's just unique you don't see it much in Australia you see it in um, in the US a bit speaking of the US uh that's during the IPO and the prospectus it was mentioned in there. Um, you know, the US is a pretty big, it's a massive opportunity for the business over the coming decades. So maybe we touched on it a little bit earlier, just, just something to leave our investors with is what makes the US um, such an appealing opportunity for the business? Because we've, and we thought about this deeply within the team before we went that we we're all up for it. And, and was it just dreaming or was the opportunity there? And we'd been consulting to the U S particularly the growers and processors for many years, including UC Davis, because we were leading the world in research and no one there was doing it very well. And the growers there weren't, you know, we think getting 
you know, the efficiencies and yields that they probably should have been getting. So knowing that the consumer over there is going to, in our view, follow similar patterns to what happened here with regards to more natural, more healthy, less refined, you know, all of those things that are a global push, particularly from, from more wealthy countries. Um, it, it became a reasonably easy decision because we know how to grow. We know where to grow. We know where to process. We know how to. We can double our research um, outcomes because we have two harvests a year, two flowerings a year. Um, mm. Everything's twice a year. Um, and, and we just needed to make sure that we could educate the consumer on the trade. And, and to be honest, that's worked so well that we're desperately short of oil. So we need to, and that's a good problem to have because we know how to do the, the latter bit, but we need to get more people to plant olives for us and we need to plant more ourselves. And pleasingly, everything that works in Australia, whether it's growing, processing, educating the, the retailers or educating consumers, works in the USA. And every time we have someone over there who says, oh, we well, don't do that over here in the US, we do something else, well, usually it doesn't work. So it's a pretty simple recipe just repeat what we've done here and do it better. And the scale of the market, they're so massive. You know, they've got 350 million people, not 25. Um, they're at one leader, the awareness of that. You know, we've been really surprised and they don't have the dominant retailers like we do here. It's more dispersed. So they're more open to um, ideas and innovation to stay at the front. And, and there's a lot of trust. You know, they're really enjoying the trust that, that we're... Um, putting into the industry for right from the bottom up, um, which means that their consumers are getting a, a better outcome and they've got less risk around the deliberation of things. So, yeah, it's it's a really exciting opportunity, but it's it's not a, I can say to people, you know, it's not a after pay or a get rich quick <laughs> thing. It's supported by tangible assets, a real century, this, you know, mm. real um, product, you know, it's hard come, hard go versus easy come, easy go. You know, it's, it, mm. and, and again, that's what, for long-term wealth creation, that's what I'm passionate about versus trying to jump on the next thing and getting it a bit wrong. Yeah. You know, obviously, it's good when you get it right, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, are, all the, are all the plans that you have for the USA, does that center on having your own production in California? Yeah, so we've already got, um We've already planted quite a few groves in the last few years, but, you know, they take mm. a while to produce. Um, we have our own mill and freehold site bottling line laboratory that's fully accredited. Um, and my, probably this coming year, something like 90% of our supply is in the harvest we're about to have in, in October will come from third-party growers. But within the next four or five years under our current scenario, that'll be probably 40% to 50% from our own groves. But we're hoping that, it might be less because it means that other growers are getting in planting, which they are. We just probably would like it to happen a little bit quicker. But if we walk the talk and do the plantings and, and the way we grow is very different to the way they've been growing in the USA um, with a lot less trees. Per, we grow a lot less trees per hectare that's suitable to every variety and they grow four times the amount of trees per hectare that's only really suitable to one variety. And that variety's got the lowest shelf life and stability and importantly health benefits. So there's a big step change in that growing way that we're introducing over there right now. And other and, and we've had other parties planning for us in that way as well. There's one more question I just have on the growth of the business, which is um, here in Australia, when I was chatting to Sam the other day, um, he was saying that a lot of the, the, the trees here in Australia still haven't reached fruiting and they're not at maturity yet anyway. So there's a lot of volume still to come from Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, heaps. Think of it almost as one of our growers producing and the other one's not, but we've got the cost of both. So what? not only will we get a lot of increased production, we won't get a lot of increased cost. So that will a lot of that will flow to the bottom line. It's a bit like you know, Sam described, you know, building a, a tollway, but it, no cars are driven on it yet, so you're not really getting the revenue, but you've got the cost of holding um, and that's a bit bit the way with the way this works. So yeah, there's, there's some really nice growth in this Australian business um, over the next five or seven years with increasing production, increasing cash flow, increasing profit. Hopefully, all come mm -hmm. from that. So maybe just end with one question, which is a bit of a, a, a softball for you, which is just um, what are you really excited about with the business over the next five years, and what should investors be paying attention to? 
Oh, I, I'm, I'm excited about the USA and, and that opportunity. I'm also, I'm actually also really excited about our zero waste initiative and the value adding of our waste stream where we're taking the antioxidants out of what's traditionally been waste. So whether that's leaves and we're doing that olive leaf extract, olive leaf tea, but we'll also um, have a lot of products in the pipeline from the antioxidants from the fruit. So when we crush the olive, we get 20% of that is extra virgin olive oil and the rest is all these biophenols and there's a lot of antioxidants in there. Only a small percentage of those end up in the oil through the process of, of spinning the oil out. It's just a centrifugal force. The rest are alive and valuable and we've worked out how to keep them alive and turn them into powder. So as a bulk ingredient supply to supplement companies and other things, I'm, I'm really excited personally. But again, we don't talk about it heaps because there's risks, there's IP and there's all these things, but we know that if we can make our waste stream, which traditionally in almost any industry is a cost, into a profit centre, that that's going to be good for the, for, for the bottom line, and, and it's, but it's also going to be good for the environment. So we're sort of trying to up the ante on that zero waste sustainability initiative. And I know everyone's saying this, but we've spent $20 million over the last seven years working it out. Um, and we're COVID slowed us down a bit, but I'm, I think that's going to be a good part of our business. Yeah, there's, um, there was a line that I read, um, which again comes from you, but it's uh, one of your dad's quotes, which is, I thought was a great one, a bit of a tongue in cheek one, a piece of advice that he'd give you, which is there's only one way to go broke. And there's only one way to go broke, spend more than you earn, which is, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, good, a good life lesson for someone that's leading a multinational business. Um, with a great team around you. So, Rob, thanks for taking some time to join me today and have this chat. Oh, thanks very much, Alan, and I yeah, really appreciate you having me on your show and um, yeah, look forward to meeting you face-to-face -face one day. <laughs>